On this panel, uh, we have uh, David Ridley from uh, Duke, the business school, uh, Aaron uh, Kesselheim from uh, Harvard Medical School, Brigham and Women's, Ben Royne also from Harvard, uh, and uh, Brian Cavini from uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, and Amy Comstock Rick of Parkinson's Action Network. And the format of the uh, presentation uh, is that uh, we are going to have a proposal uh, from uh, David of a, uh, a new uh, uh, idea, a new proposal for extending data exclusivity in the pharmaceutical world. And then I'm going to ask the uh, panelists who represent uh, various different viewpoints from patients to payors like Blue Cross uh, to Aaron from the, the academic perspective um, and uh, Ben from the perspective of a, of, a, of a lawyer and economist who focuses on the field to comment on that proposal and then finally uh, Jerome Reitman from, from Duke Law School will provide a, um, uh, a, a quick uh, comment on the overall panel. So uh, it's an ambitious program and uh, why don't we uh, start with David. Thank you. Thank you. So Gil uh, surveyed the audience a moment ago and we found that there are, are a considerable number of lawyers with us. Uh, I am not a lawyer. Uh, instead, I'm one of the good guys. Uh, I'm an economist. Uh, right, Pothan? We're the good guys. Yes, yes, that's right. Thank you. We like to believe you. <laughs> compared to what? Well, compared to the lawyers, right? So, and, and so while I'm affiliated with Duke, I'm actually across the parking lot from the Duke Law School. So I don't get to see Stuart and Artie and Jerry as much as I like, so I have to come to Washington to get to see them. So. It's a pleasure to be here. So there are various ways of um, encouraging innovation. Uh, one that we'll be talking that I'll be talking about uh, now will be uh, monopoly power awarded from the government in the form of patents and exclusivity. You can also imagine that even without this, there could be some monopoly power from differentiation, from first mover advantage, from brand name, from from being specialized, from from being better at making the product. Um, uh, down here, another mechanism is uh, just to provide research subsidies in advance, for example, from the NIH or the Gates Foundation, uh, to encourage uh, research, to pay for it up front rather than paying for it after the fact. Uh, I want to mention this one very briefly, prizes from the government or foundation, because several of you mentioned earlier that you represent foundations and, and consumer advocacy groups associated with rare neglected diseases. I, that uh, made me want to talk about the priority review voucher, that's our paper in 2006 that became law in 2007. So this is a prize for developing a treatment for a neglected disease, later extended to rare pediatric cancer. So it may be of interest for a few people in the room, and I'd love to talk to you afterward. So for example, uh, in my class in October, I hosted the CEO of nanovirucides. Nanovirucide, nanotechnology, viruses kill. So they use nanotechnology to kill viruses. They're going after HIV and flu, but because of, of this prize, they're now also going after dengue, and there are no currently approved treatments for dengue for breakbone fever. And so if they develop a treatment for dengue, they'll get a voucher for faster review of something else. Not the dengue drug, but faster review of some other drug. And they can sell that right. So I have a call I, I need to return to a banker this week trying to value uh, the voucher, because we don't know what they're worth yet. We hope they're valuable, we're not so sure yet, because there's about to be a leishmaniasis drug approved in December, probably, that will probably win a voucher. And from a little company called Paladin that doesn't have much value other than the vouchers, they're trying to value the company. But, but companies like nanovirucides have been able to get funding from venture capitalists because there's this prize that they could earn that may or may not have some value. We'll, we'll soon get a better feel for that, maybe in the next month or two. Okay, but uh, so love to talk to you afterward about that if you're interested or in the discussion or whatever, but um, really I'll, I'll be focusing on this uh, monopoly power for the government in the form of 
of patents and exclusivity. So several people made this point earlier, but I had pretty grass and I made the pretty grass and darn it, I'm going to show them. <laughs> so um, so here, here's patent. You know patents are for 20 years. Uh, there's also the Hatch-Waxman extension here. To, so some of this time on your patent was lost in clinical trials in this gray area in R&D. And so your effective patent life, the time you're on the market with your patent, is, is, uh, is not the full 20 years. So some of this time is given back to you in this Hatch-Waxman extension. You can get up to five years total, um, up to 14 years for this length to make up for some of this time lost. And in the US, we have, uh, and, and in fact, uh, Phil Johnson uh, just a moment ago mentioned the data exclusivity for biologics. He said it's 12 years, but it might not be 12 years for long, because there's been discussion of cutting that. Um, in contrast with uh, small molecules, that's for large molecules. For small molecules, you get five years plus perhaps an extra three with new data, with new indications. So this is exclusivity versus patents. And in the European Union, it's, it's, it's still different. So here's your 10 years. Eight of that is data exclusivity. Two of that is market exclusivity. And then you get an extra year for an additional indication. Uh, notice uh, that these run concurrently. So in this picture I've drawn, the exclusivity actually doesn't bind. It's the patent that binds. But in some cases, if the patent is not so solid, or maybe it's a molecule that's been around for a long time, and so the patent has long since expired, uh, this exclusivity may be useful for you. So again, uh, the Europeans use uh, 10 plus 1 across the pills, across the pharmaceuticals and the biologics, and in the US it's 5 plus 3 uh, versus 2. And I want to make the argument that uh, this distinction, you know, I, I, that I, I really prefer the Europeans. I don't see why we distinguish really between pharmaceuticals and biologics here. I think it would be quite rational to, uh, to, to harmonize. Thank you. So where did we come up with this 12 years? I think uh, Senator Kennedy from Massachusetts gets some, uh, uh, is partially responsible for being an advocate of this. Obviously, Massachusetts has a vibrant biotech industry. My colleague, Henry Grabowski, uh, also has some responsibility. So he wrote this paper in Nature Reviews Drug Discovery that says, so here's, here's uh, money over time and you're investing in R&D, you're losing money until launch here at zero and you start making money. And, and he estimated that the break-even point is here at 12.9 uh, years if you think the opportunity cost of capital is 11.5%. So if you think the pharmaceutical company could be making a rate of return of 11.5% on that money, then the break-even point is at 12.9. If you think that the um, cost of capital is even higher, then the break-even point is even further out. And if you think it's shorter, then it, then it obviously would, would move to the left here. So, so this paper was quite influential. This is a 2008 paper. And uh, so this really had, had an impact on, on, uh, on the 12 years, I think. What would happen if we shortened this or lengthened this? So if, if we increase the uh, exclusivity for biologics, we, and or for pharmaceutical, sorry, let's, let's do decrease. So if we were to cut this, so if we were to cut this down to uh, a shorter period, cut it from 12 down to 11 or even further perhaps as um, the president has suggested, we would get earlier access to biosimilars. Biosimilars are kind of like generic pharmaceuticals except not quite. I, th I think maybe a better analog for biosimilars is Me Too drugs. So then the question is whether, how, at least in the short run, the long run it might be more like generics, but at least in the short run it's more like Me Too drugs. So how eager are we to get Me Too drugs? Well, I, I don't think Me Too drugs actually decrease drug spending. They increase variety potentially. They might decrease price a little bit, but uh, they're also typically advertised and in general raise spending. And that's another reason Congress wasn't so eager to, to make that a, a lower amount of time. Okay, if we decrease the exclusivity for biologics, we might lose some marginal drugs. So let's say we cut this time from 12.9 years to a little bit shorter, maybe more like the Europeans. We might lose some marginal drugs, drugs with lower value, drugs treating smaller patient populations, orphan drugs. That could be of some concern, although we also have some mechanisms like the Orphan Drug Act to try to account for that. Drugs with lower probability of success, drugs with longer trials. Um, these are drugs that typically have shorter patent life because more of the patent clock is ticked and the um, Exclusivity is a bit more important, but so we might lose a few marginal drugs. They might be these drugs. 
Conversely, if we increase the exclusivity for pharma through a harmonization, we, we, we get the converse of that. So, and I, I think this lines up, you know, it would, it would encourage more orphan drugs and, and drugs with uh, longer trials. So, so there's some trade-offs here, but in general, I think this is a really artificial distinction, and I think it would make sense to harmonize. Just f following a, a point uh, that Phil Johnson made previously, he worried that this is, obvious, that this is squishy, that uh, this 12 years of exclusivity is squishy. Within six months, the president was saying maybe that should be shorter. I think that's a fair point, although I would suggest that maybe it's squishy more in the short run. This has been around since Hatch-Waxman in 1984. This has been longer, around longer than our current patent term. So our patent terms went from 17 years to 20 years in 1995. This has been around since 1984. So while I, I agree that this is squishy for now, and in fact I'm arguing that it should be squishy, uh, I think we, we could easily uh, settle in and, and, and see uh, a, a nice long period um, like the other exclusivity period. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess squishy but not too squishy. <laughs> squishy but not too squishy. <laughs> Just right. Yeah. Okay, so Aaron um, Kesselheim from Harvard is, is now going to uh, speak and, and I think propose a somewhat different approach. Um, yeah, so thanks. And I really appreciate the invitation to come. And so I'm going to talk a little bit today about, the, uh, the, in my time, the question of, of do market exclusivity stimulate transformative pharmaceutical innovation? And I think one way of trying to address the question of what would a, pro, uh, a proposal like the idea of extending data exclusivity for small molecules by five years or extending market exclusivities in other realms um, would be to look at, at occasions where we've done this in the past. And so what I want to tell uh, at the beginning is, is three ca um, cautionary tales, one from the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, the Orphan Drug Act, and the Pediatric Exclusivity Extension. I thought it was interesting to think about these as cautionary tales because when most people talk about these legislations, these are usually considered to be the most important and most uh, um, effective pieces of legislation that we have out there in, in terms of incentivizing pharmaceutical innovation. Um, but I want to argue that the actual legacy of these, uh, of these pieces of legislation is a lot more complicated than, uh, than a lot of policymakers and people uh, actually think. So the Prescription Drug User Fee Act of 1992 um, was uh, designed in a time of, of relatively limited FDA resources, although uh, the government had started to, to uh, fix that in the years prior to the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. And, and at that point, the, these limited resources led to um, very extended le review time lengths for, for prescription drugs. Um, and so there were drugs that were reviewed, uh, that, were, that were spending uh, many months and indeed years at the FDA before they were acted on by the, by the reviewers. And this was attacked by um, activists who were seeking, in, uh, in some cases, earlier access to, for example, HIV-AIDS drugs, and also by, the, by pharmaceutical manufacturers, claiming that these delays were reducing their market exclusivity time uh, and increasing their research and development costs. So when PDUFA was, uh, was organized, in addition to providing user fees for, uh, to, to help increase the FDA's resources, um, it set very strict limits. Um, on when new drug applications had to be acted on uh, by, uh, so for a, they had to be acted on by a year, but before a year uh, um, for standard review drugs and for six months for priority review drugs. And the idea here was that shortening FDA review times by, um, uh, would extend the market exclusivity period um, and allow uh, a greater <laughs> amount of this uh, revenue t uh, generating time for, for patented products. Um, but what, what was the actual impact of the, uh, the Prescription Drug User Fee Act? Did it have any impact on, on, on stimulating innovation? And what you can see here from this graph um, is that there was actually a burst of new approvals as this logjam of, of uh, backlogged NDAs was approved. But shortly after that, the number of new drugs approved by the FDA each year um, receded back to the mean that had, uh, had been established over the past uh, previous decades. <clears throat> but indeed, the Prescription Drug User Fee Act also had a number of unintended consequences. Um, a recent study, a study from 2008 published in, in the New England Journal of Medicine showed that the drugs that were being approved just before these arbitrary administrative deadlines were more likely to have safety-based withdrawals or black box hoardings added to them later in their, in their um, marketing time. And, that, and other studies have shown that drugs receiving faster reviews by the FDAs are found later to have higher risks of adverse reactions when they're, when they're prescribed. 
So the, uh, the next cautionary tale is of the Orphan Drug Act of 1983. So this Orphan Drug Act has been mentioned a few times today. For conditions affecting fewer than 200,000 people, it provided three primary incentives. Federal funding of grants and contracts, an additional tax credit of 50% of, of clinical testing costs, and this exclusive right to market the orphan drug for seven years from the date of marketing approval. This uh, seven-year exclusivity period has been uh, considered to be a very, uh, a very important factor in, um, in providing incentives for orphan drugs to be developed. And indeed, since the orphan drug exclusivity was passed, there have now been you know, 300 going on 400 orphan drugs that have been approved by the FDA. But what role does orphan drug exclusivity actually play in the development and, and approval of those products? So um, this is uh, research that I did with, with Bob and Sampat, who, who was here, um, a part of the panel earlier today. And we found that actually the orphan drug exclusivity was less than the patent terms for the majority of the drugs uh, that, that we looked at, the orphan drugs approved. And, and, uh, and then when we looked more in depth at this, the case studies of, of other products um, uh, within this fund, we found that actually the Orphan Drug Act does very, did very little in terms of actually in, um, providing additional market exclusivity for, um, for the products um, and, and providing uh, additional incentives. Um, another perspective is by looking at when the orphan drug exclusivity is actually granted. And, and so in a study that I did where I looked at a, a sample of 15 orphan cancer drugs approved um, in this year, in the, uh, between the years 2004 and 2010, we found that these drugs were receiving their orphan designation a median of only two and a half years before the drugs were approved by the FDA. What does this mean? Do, you know, is, is it the case that pharmaceutical companies are delaying their receipt of the orphan exclusivity until they can determine that the end product will be marketable. That's possible, although it doesn't make sense because it would make sense to try to get this benefit as soon as possible so that you could sell it to um, your investors and whoever else you would need and, and to, to, you know, to be able to stake your claim in the market. Or is it possible that they're, that they're identifying relatively late in the process that their product will be useful in an orphan disease? In which case, the question is, what is the role of this exclusivity actually playing uh, in driving drug development? And of course, there have been some public health concerns related to the approval of orphan drugs. First being, the, there's the complicated access to approved orphan drugs given their extremely high cost. And despite the substantial push incentives provided, orphan drugs remain the most expensive drugs on the marketplace and, and, uh, you know, and provide, um, uh, which provides a substantial, uh, you know, can provide substantial access problems. And then, of course, there are other studies showing that there is gaming of the system and that pharmaceutical companies have strategically positioned drugs as orphan products, um, which allows the drug to be approved on the basis of being tested at fewer patients, uh, which ultimately leads to greater potential for off-label use once the drug is approved. And then finally, the pediatric drug exclusivity. The motivation here was to try to get more dr uh, drugs tested in pediatric patients and so in order to do that, they added six months of market exclusivity to a drug's patent protected period. So what we found is that in the, in the first decade after the pediatric exclusivity extension, um, there, was, there was some success on some, by, you know, by according to some measures of the, you know, um, you know a number of studies and a number of, of changes in product labeling in these various categories. Um, but in actuality, when you actually, you know, again, dig down and look at the studies that were done and the drugs that were affected, uh, what, 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 we've, what, we've, what has been found is that the, the pediatric exclusivity actually ends up affecting, is more likely to affect popular adult drugs, the Viagras and Lipitors of the world, but not necessarily the drugs of, of true pediatric public health importance. A lot of these studies were of subpar quality, they weren't published in the literature, or they were delayed until the end of the market exclusivity period because that's when it made the most financial sense to do these products, given the fact that they're only going to provide six months of exclusivity towards the end of the ex uh, of market exclusivity period. And again, and when you look at the cost of these trials as compared to the benefit that's received from the, from the six months of patent exclusivity, you see about a 10 to 1 net economic benefits, and in some drug classes, as high as 17 to 1, and which leads again to the question, given the fact that of these difficulties, you know, was the goal in these cases to in, uh, obtain the pediatric exclusivity incentive, or was it to conduct clinically meaningful tests in a reasonable time frame? So, um, you know, what are some of the lessons here from these past experiences? First, market exclusivity incentives have substantial secondary outcomes and unintended consequences in, in the public marketplace. You should not incentivize uh, uh, innovation by reducing or, or forcing arbitrary limits on FDA review time. Um, you should not necessarily incentivize uh, without linking directly to the public health outcome that you're trying to receive. And you shouldn't assume that by increasing exclusivity that you'll get a market uh, an efficient market response. 
Um, but however, these lessons aren't necessarily gained. Um, when, you're, you know, when you talk about antibiotic innovation, the, the question of now of how to develop and, in, uh, and develop incentives for new antibiotics, again, a lot of the issues here, are, a lot of the, the solutions here are to provide longer exclusivity periods for antibiotics, and in fact, that just happened in the last year. So uh, here you see a couple of decades of, of data on new antibiotic approvals. At each step along the way, each of these arrows indicate other legislation that extends market exclusivity that could potentially be relevant to new antibiotics, but you're not seeing new antibiotics being developed. So uh, this is my last slide, um, which are just my uh, um, thoughts about what the alternative and better solutions are. A lot of them have been discussed earlier today, and I think that, that they uh, bear a lot more further discussion about better funding for basic science in this open innovation model, um, directly linking incentives to desired health outcomes, um, and again, when a, when a prescription drug manufacturer invests substantial sums of money in discovering a drug, and, and you know, that the, the manufacturer is obviously entitled to a fair return on their investment, but the public, I think, deserves some benefit too. And so if the development of a drug subsidized by NCATS or subsidized by other some publicly funded mechanism, it is reasonable to expect payback in terms of making sure the drug is affordable or that some share of the revenues is returned to the public infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. We're now going to uh, turn to uh, Ben Roin from Harvard Law School, uh, who is uh, Ben has, has focused substantially on uh, incentives in uh, healthcare. So uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, so I'm going, to talk, I'm going to begin, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the sort of framing of this question, and then I'm actually going to talk about something that's come up a few different times during the ARC too, which is uh, a slightly different problem, which is once drugs have gone generic, what do we do? Um, so this is sort of a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I've been talking about this for a while. Uh, it's uh, what I describe as unpatentable drugs, but uh, they've been recast as dormant therapies, which is actually a much better title, because dormant is a real word. Uh, <laughs> so new drugs, uh, you can't, just to make it simple, so you have to get on the market with these things, and it costs a lot of money to do that. You've got to go through clinical trials. It's expensive. Um, uh, companies, the way they make their money, the way the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, their business model operates, is they keep generics off the market for long enough to recoup their investment. That's just the business model. Um, they primarily, and currently they primarily rely on the patent system for that protection, although potentially less so with biologics now, but certainly with small molecules. Um, the problem is the patent system does not seem to be particularly well uh, targeted towards uh, encouraging this kind of investment. And the reason why is that when you have an initial disclosure of a drug, that's going to render the drug unpatentable. Uh, it's going to essentially make you can't because the drug's no longer new or the drug's obvious in light of some earlier publication. Uh, but we don't have the drug. It's just a publication. It's just an old patent. It's, a, it's, a, it's an article that was written 30 years ago. We actually still need someone to put it through clinical trials. And so you end up with uh, potentially vast numbers, and actually, in reality, truly vast numbers of unpatentable compounds uh, just by virtue of the way, and this is just looking at the patents, but patent filings you're getting you know, uh, roughly 800,000 unique chemical compounds disclosed over a nine year period. Uh, over that same amount of time, you get about 230 new drugs on the market. The rest of those things have been disclosed, the vast, vast majority have never been tested, never been investigated. We just, you know, we don't know much about them, uh, but those can't be patented anymore, or at least it's, it's, it's tricky to patent them. Uh, and you know, there's lots of reasons why pharmacopoeias might not pursue a drug uh, that have nothing to do with the fact that it doesn't work, including maybe we're just not pursuing it for that particular disease at that particular time, or science advances, or they made a mistake, lots of reasons. And so we have just tons and tons of compounds in, sitting around, technically in the public domain, but we don't, they're not benefiting us. Uh, I think of this as actually a very easy problem to fix. Uh, at least, I mean, it, it takes a lot of legislative work, but at least conceptually it's easy because uh, the problem here is we have a gap in our system of protecting drugs, encouraging them, uh, and so you just fill the gap. Uh, and the way we have to do that is, you know, if, if the reason why companies need protection to get on the market is that they, they need, uh, it, it just takes a lot of effort and time to satisfy the FDA's clinical trial requirements, we can provide incentives for that. We can link it to the fact that you went through and got that protection, you, uh, your, you, the fact that you went through and you ran those clinical trials. And we can do that with data exclusivity and market exclusivity. Uh, there's actually a bill pending before Congress currently that takes a stab at this. Um, uh, it's called the Modern Cures Act. I, sort of, I, th I think of the structure of the Modern Cures Act is more or less a no-brainer, although you can quibble about the details. So it uses 15 years of market exclusivity. Uh, some of you wouldn't like that number, but you know, it's a number. Um, 
Uh, it's got restrictions, so this is only going to this is only going to work for uh, for chemical entities that, that aren't currently on the market. So this doesn't work for new uses of existing drugs. Uh, and uh, it says that it has to satisfy an unmet medical need, which has to do with concerns about companies pursuing drugs that maybe aren't so valuable. Um, and it deals with a problem we were talking about in the first panel today, which is the shenanigans that go on at the end of the patent term. We have all that litigation; it's kind of crazy. It says we're not going to do any of that. Right, so it's 15 or bust, and you could change the number, but that's sort of the structure that it's pushing for. I, I, I sort of view this as a no-brainer because at least it links it to what we were trying to encourage. Um, there's another problem that's much, much harder to solve because, it don't, because we don't have a system currently set up that works with it, and that's the problem with new uses. Uh, but so, uh, just to provide a little background on this, so right now we're, so we've got this book that's often described as a productivity crisis. We're spending tens of billions of dollars, maybe $100 billion, uh, I'm all the same, to noble drug development programs a year, trying to come up with new drugs, out of this, we're getting about 30, a little bit less, 30 new uh, molecular entities each year uh, approved by the FDA. Uh, this is really expensive. Um, uh, it's generally been the industry that this cost model is unsustainable. And as a result, we're getting significant cutbacks in R&D investments. We've got uh, VCs fleeing the biotech space. It's, it, it, it's a genuine problem. At the same time, we've got a roughly uh, uh, 2,000 off-patent drugs that are just sitting there. Uh, from what we can tell, and this is just sort of you know, based on prior experience, these things are probably going to be good for a lot of other stuff. So we know drugs have multiple targets. Uh, we know that, uh, oftentimes new uses are discovered through serendipity. And it's just sort of in general, this has been viewed by medicinal care. Some people as a good uh, uh, opportunity, a good uh, sort of avenue for doing further research. But you have more or less zero money going into it from industry and limited public funding. So it's just limited budgets available from the government. Uh, so the, turns out this problem, we've learned this over the past five years, is way worse than what you'd otherwise think. Uh, advances in il, in silico screening, so basically computer model screening, and we've, there's some sort of advances in science that allow us to do this now. Um, it now looks like this arsenal of old drugs contains within, you know, just it's hitting a bunch of stuff, contains within it the potential to treat a lot of different diseases. Uh, and so, you know, and this is, I've got, a whole, I've got a paper on this which sort of collects through a whole bunch of different sources, but here are just some quotes from, you know, and whether this is true or not, we'll find out. We won't find out in the current path, but conceivably we could find out. Um, it looks like that it's possible these older drugs could provide treatments for, very effective treatments for a lot of different forms of cancer. Uh, for, there's discussion about using it for Alzheimer's, uh, for a lot of rare diseases, and that's actually an important line of research uh, in this area, because we'll talk about the, it's actually cheaper, much, much cheaper to, to uh, push for drugs in this space. And so this is potential, this at least, this. This line of avenue using old generic drugs to treat new diseases looks like it might provide a number of medical breakthroughs. Um, it's also, and this is important, it's a much better economic model for developing new drugs. Can you do this? Okay, sorry. It's a much better economic model for developing new drugs. It's much faster, uh, and, you know, potentially way, way faster, so it could cut the time of drug development down by a third. Um, uh, from what we can tell, there's a far lower risk of failure here than when you're working with a drug that we already know works for one indication. The risk of failure may be a small fraction of what it is normally, and the costs are far lower. And the, so these are just ballpark figures because we don't have really close estimates, uh, and it, it may be that, that our repurposing is actually much cheaper than this figure here. Um, because it's so much cheaper, what it means is pharmaceutical companies could tackle uh, much more risky drugs. That means uh, novel drug targets, untested, uh, unverified drug targets, and they could go after smaller markets, uh, which is one of the things we complain about a lot. Um, uh, conceivably, it could help overcome the productivity crisis by giving pharmaceutical companies uh, an opportunity to sort of, you know, refill their pipelines. Uh, and uh, and I, I want to talk about this a lot because we've actually heard a bunch, but I think it's interesting. It's a good way of spanning the valley of death we've currently got because NIH, they can, uh, public researchers, it's really easy for them to just take generic drugs and play around with them because they're cheap, they're already available. They don't need to run, they don't need to do any of the, the really difficult preclinical stuff. And uh, the public sector could jump immediately into, NIH could jump immediately into starting to fund phase one or phase two A trials. And then you've got, you could sort of, you would have a pharmaceutical, if, if this model worked, you would have a pharmaceutical company on the opposite end who could then pick up the, uh, the, the cost of the phase three trials, which is sort of the, the big barrier for us in terms of the, the public sector research. Uh, the problem is this doesn't happen. It doesn't happen at all. In fact, the NIH is more or less, not entirely, but largely given up on repurposing generic drugs. And the reason why is there's no industry on the opposite end to pay for it. Um, why not? Well, as I mentioned, the, the way the industry works is they keep generics off the market. They, they need to make enough money while generics are off the market to, for it to be worthwhile. Um, we don't give protection for developing new indications for uh, existing drugs. We won't allow companies, there are some exceptions to this, but it's not very common. We won't allow companies to keep generics off the market uh, with one of their drugs if it's already been approved for an indication to develop it for a new indication. Uh, uh, you know, the, they can't delay generic entry on that. Now that we actually, interestingly, we will give them patent protection over the new use. 
And you could imagine we actually do, we also provide data exclusivity over the new use. But they can't enforce that. And the reason why they can't enforce that protection is that they don't know when a doctor has prescribed an old drug for a new use or for an old use. So they have no way of sort of charging the payer for the new, if, they, if they're prescribing it for the new indication. And because they don't do that, they just, it's just written off. Now, if we had a model where they knew when, the, when a physician had prescribed a drug for a new indication as opposed to the old one, what that would mean is that they could, in some sense, they could just bill the payer for that. And they, that could work through a number of different ways. They could actually just sort of require the pharmacist to dispense an, exp an expensive brand name drug uh, and be reimbursed for that. Or you could just have direct billing between the, uh, the pharmaceutical company and the insurer. Lots of different ways you can imagine that. So uh, this is essentially an observation problem. It strikes me as a very solvable observation problem, an incredibly solvable observation problem. The reason why it strikes me as really solvable is, in some sense, insurance companies have already solved it. Insurance companies right now, when they, they want to control the prescribing of expensive brand name drugs, so they use something called prior authorization. What they say is, look, physicians, you need to tell us ahead of time what you're prescribing this drug for, whether it's one of the covered indications, and then we'll give you approval for it. And they can sort of deter fraudulent reporting because they have access to patients' health records. And now that doesn't work everywhere, but it works in a lot of places, because there are a lot of places where through the, you know, the combination of just having them report it and having access to the health records, you can make sure that, that you know, they're not going to lie. And health insurance companies report that this is incredibly effective. So all we need to do to fix the problem is in some sense expand that model to include sellers. And there's two easy ways of doing that. Well, one of them is easier than the other. One is we need uh, to just take e-prescribing software, which is currently expanding and being used uh, uh, by physicians. And there's actually a big government program in the US, at least, to encourage physicians to, to use this stuff by essentially subsidizing and penalizing physicians who, don't, who aren't using e-prescribing software. Just change the eligibility requirements for that e-prescribing software to qualify for this program to, make, to say that it has to have this indication reporting feature in it. And, in, and interestingly, in Ontario, they already do this. And there have been studies of it, and actually, apparently, it's quite accurate. Physicians, when they have this sort of software, they just check the box for what the indication is, and, and it works fine. So that would, and then once you've got physicians doing that, we're going to have records of indications. Now, we still have a problem in that uh, you can imagine uh, physicians not telling the truth. And so we need the same thing insurance companies do, which is to check. And so you'd have to, and this would be a little more controversial, you'd have to expand uh, uh, the sort of access to patient records to pharmaceutical companies. And obviously, that would raise uh, privacy concerns, so we'd have to do things like like limit what the access is for, uh, potentially make it de-identified. You could expand HIPAA to protect privacy. There's lots of things we could do within this space to sort of ensure that the uh, pharmaceutical companies, when they have access, and it also doesn't even, conceivably it could just be a proxy for pharmaceutical companies, it doesn't need to be them, uh, those companies themselves, but ensure that they don't misuse the data or use it in ways we don't want them to. Uh, and you know, the other thing is, uh, uh, this won't work everywhere, and this is sort of obvious. You can imagine all sorts of indications, particularly in the sort of the, the neuropsych space where it's hard to tell what one diagnosis for another. That's okay. It doesn't have to work everywhere. It'll just work in the places where it does. And in those places, you could, you know, companies could enforce these, uh, these new use patents. You could have differential pricing by indication. And the thing that I think to think about is that the space where this will work is going to grow. Because as te uh, diagnostic te technology advances and as personalized medicine advances, in our health records, there's going to be much better sort of information, clear information linking what it, the diagnosis is to the prescription. And also the, the space in which we're prescribing drugs, it's just through this move to personalized medicine, is going to grow. And so this model here, in some sense, should, while now it's not perfect, while I don't know what 50 percent or what percentage of prescriptions would work for, that's going to get bigger and bigger. Uh, so that, that's my uh, proposal. Thank you very much, Ben. We now turn to uh, Brian Cavini from uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina, um, who is, I guess, living and working at, currently at the sharp end of the healthcare delivery center uh, system in terms of, uh, of working for Blue Cross Blue Shield. So and, it's, and it's been a fun six weeks since the healthcare.gov has opened up. Yes, yeah, so well, when we, when we, when we, didn't, when, when we didn't see you last night or this morning, we thought perhaps <laughs> that we weren't going to see you at all today. So exactly. thank you very exactly. much for coming. My, my pleasure. I don't have any slides, yeah. um, um, but I do want to uh, address, I'm going to play a lot off of, of some of the comments that Ben just made. I think David is exactly right to point out this relatively arbitrary nature of the difference between the exclusivity period for biologics and pharmaceuticals. And I'm certain every one of you expects me as a representative of the payer community to assume that we need to shorten those as much as possible. We want the, to we want the lowest possible cost for every pharmaceutical no matter what, and that's going to be our standpoint. But I'm going to argue that there are quite a few nuances to that, and that would not be our position. But rather, um, we're more interested in some of the downstream impacts that we can play on. And so what we want all of you 
uh, policy wonks and thinkers and regulators to do is optimize the incentives throughout the system so that we actually get the most possible innovation out of pharma and biotech so that we can get the most possible choices. And then we've got a lot of tools in our tool belt to figure out the cost equation after that, after that happens once they're on the market. We're really in, interested in, in the competition within the payer community is with each other over showing the best possible quality outcomes to our customer group. And right now, the easiest to demonstrate value to is the large employer group. Definitely a shrinking market, but an important one where we learn a lot about how we conduct our business and how we try to play with the incentives in the system. Almost every payer either owns or partners very closely with pharmacy benefit management companies who do kind of the hand-to-hand -hand combat with pharma companies to figure out the best negotiated rates they can for any individual ingredient. And then we benefit by that the larger and larger volumes that we can drive through that. But as Ben rightly pointed out, in the current structure, that portends that we should just try to get the lowest price we can per unit. But there are a couple of important influences in the way the healthcare system is evolving that make us change that view. We're being measured more and more by our customers, but also by government regulators and others in terms of um, things like our HEDIS outcomes, where we're actually partnering with pharma companies and others very heavily to increase the total number of pharmaceuticals consumed by our members, policyholders, patients. Um, because we know there's a tremendous number of patients out there who are not adherent with the prescriptions that they're on. They're not taking the medications that we know would make them better. And we are more interested in the total cost of care or the total outcome. Pharmaceuticals are really only 18 or 19 percent of the total health care spend. So in, in our view, that's actually a small part that we're more than happy to make a big investment to get better um, better pharmaceuticals and biologics for patients with particular conditions. Because we know the trade-off there in many cases is avoiding some other downstream surgery or procedure or much, much, much more expensive thing that, that we, the payer, would have to take a look at. So that's why I think it's a nuanced view. And if we get more innovative pharmaceuticals and biologics that we're able to have available, then we can do really intricate cost-benefit analyses over long periods of time, the average tenure of our members, to be able to figure out how we want to incentivize that system and how we want to drive the various ways that we can hopefully change physician behavior to optimize those different tools that they have, using some of the tools that Ben mentioned. So for example, if something does cost too much, if a drug does cost too much, many different ways that we can help put a governor on that and drive physician behavior in other ways. Uh, benefit design is evolving rapidly, partially because of some of the new rules in the Affordable Care Act and the way that the exchange plans are having to drive the lowest total price to maximize the subsidies coming from the federal government. But we've got many, many customer groups now looking for four and five and beyond tiers in their, in their pharmacy formularies. Uh, we can make adjustments in formularies themselves. So the more Me Too drugs we have, for example, David, you said in the current environment, that raises potentially total spend. Um, but it's good to have those different options because as we do move from our current haphazard environment, we're just right on the cusp of a more population health management approach right now where we get a better sense of the populations by using analytics. But we really want to get probably five, 10 years from now closer to what Ben suggested, which is actually using with each individual patient, having a strict set of criteria by which we would expect the physician to use personalized medicine, genomic, proteomic techniques to figure out which particular pharmaceutical or biologic is most appropriate for that person, rather than, frankly, carpet bombing them with everything that's on the guidelines coming out of the specialty societies. So we've got a few programs right now, for example, where we bundle together the companion diagnostic genomic test along with whatever the actual therapeutic is. And in many cases, we'll apply an actual prior approval where you can't actually prescribe or we won't pay for a particular expensive medicine unless it is preceded by the specific genomic that suggests it's the right one and that that patient would then respond to that particular therapy. So it could be that Me Too is in the current environment when we don't have any pretest probability to know who to give what, that that makes complete sense. But if we get better clarity on, on who they can go to, we might increase the total number of people taking that category of medications, but decrease the number that any one particular one is on so that we're actually matching those up better. And then 
hopefully avoiding some of the other downstream medical impacts that we would then otherwise be paying for. And it can improve the quality of life and, and outcomes for many of the, of the members receiving those. Uh, other tools that we have, of course, formulary decisions, all the prior approval, um, quantity limits, step therapies, care management programs. We actually would essentially require that someone work with a pharmacist or one of our nurses or some other person to decrease wastage in particular pharmacy usage, uh, as well as to make sure that they understand adverse effects, adverse benefits. That's reported appropriately in accordance with the law, but also um, keeps their treating physician in the loop rather than just in between you know, every three or six month visits that they may have with that particular uh, physician. So again, we look at the the total cost of care or the total value derived from any particular group of therapeutic decisions that would be made for a particular condition, each of the individual pharmaceuticals or biologics within that then um, um, helps us with the, the cost-benefit analysis and, and what they're comparing it against. I don't know that we have enough data yet be, um, since the change to the 12-year period on, on biologics to know whether or not that that was partially responsible for the inflated percentage there, the inflated cost there. Um, much has been made about the decrease in the total spend uh, or the increase annually in spend in the healthcare system since probably the beginning of the recession, pointing mainly to economic factors, decreases in discretionary care, choices that people make. Um, I think a, a big part of it that we're seeing in our data is also the fact that there's been a significant increase in the generic dispensing rate. There's been a decrease in the number of blockbusters, as we've heard today. There's been an increased number of blockbuster drugs going off patent, the Lipitors, et cetera, that have saved many, many millions of dollars for each payer as those have gone off patent. And then um, some of those other factors. The one, the one part of the industry that's the most problematic for us is the specialty drug industry currently growing at about 18, 19% per year and where a big percentage of our focus is, even though only one to 2% of our total number of policyholders takes a specialty pharmaceutical, that is one of the primary cost drivers that we're seeing. Hmm. I'm not pointing to the exclusivity period as being a reason for that. There are many, many other factors involved in that. But if normalizing the exclusivity period helps uh, in some way shed some light on that, and if it does have some minimal impact, then it is definitely worth taking a look at different proposals that would do that. There are two other um, trends that are going to be impacting the next probably 10 years of revenue projections for the pharmaceutical industry, even far beyond probably the, our current discussion today. And, and you know, currently it's seen that the payer community is in a mother may I mode where doctors have to get permission to prescribe something to give to their patient. But a, a much more important trend because all we're really doing is putting some, some basic broad guardrails around what FDA approval, FDA approved medications are available for our members. But two particular trends which are going to change that even further are uh, partially from the Affordable Care Act, but partially were in motion even before that was passed. One is the rise of consumerism. We're getting tremendous pressure by both our individual consumers as well as large groups still in the employer-based health insurance market to provide better cost and quality transparency tools so that any particular person can get a better sense of what exactly something is going to cost them out of pocket. The out of pocket costs have doubled over the past 10 years just through normal market forces in the way the insurance market has been expanding. And the Affordable Care Act, given the actuarial values on the exchange products, is certainly going to heighten that even more. So that individual consumers making choices between the cost of different pharmaceuticals will be an even bigger factor in their purchasing behavior than even some of the insurance company policies around access and uh, benefit design, for example, for some of those. The other is the emerging very slowly but clearly gaining momentum trend of movement towards value-based payment. Rather than the um, current fee-for-service system that we are, are so used to in the insurance industry. And so currently there is this antagonism between the physicians wanting to get access to whatever we might have in our formulary and us going through the prior approval process and saying yes. And so that tends to be a little bit antagonistic. Where that will change very quickly is all of a sudden, as we have, even in North Carolina, a significant number of gain-sharing arrangements and or risk-bearing now shifting back a little bit more towards the provider community where we're serving more as just the financing bank in the middle, if you will, 
but really the providers are now not only making the significant clinical decisions, but also some of the financial decisions because that health system or practice stands to gain at the end of the year if they were more efficient with the resources that they were able to marshal for their patients throughout the year. So rather than just wanting whatever the next new cool approved drug is regardless of price per unit, they now are going to be intensely interested in getting cost effectiveness data from the pharmaceutical industry as they're making both guideline health system wide decisions for what clinical algorithms they're going to expect their clinicians to follow, as well as at the individual doctor or PA or nurse practitioner level when making specific prescription decisions for any one particular patient, they're going to now consider cost as one of the factors in addition to uh, in addition to the clinical efficacy of any particular drug that they might prescribe. Those two factors will have a significant shift uh, in addition to the other economic factors that, that the other folks on the panel have said. So in their other small, uh, uh, relatively unnoticed aspects of the ACA that are important factors, one is starting uh, in a, just a few weeks. Uh, we'll be paying the uh, comparative effectiveness research fees for every policyholder that we had, hopefully stimulating some good research to figure out for us and for now risk-bearing physicians to figure out what the, the best possible uh, clinical utility of any, any given uh, pharmaceutical will be. The other is requiring that drug spend as well as co-pays, co-insurance, and other aspects of the pharmaceutical component of health insurance will now have to go in within the accumulator systems as part of the total out-of-pocket maximums uh, for policies under the Affordable Care Act. So causing us to change all of our systems, causing us to include those dollars in the out-of-pocket maximums so people, as they potentially hit their deductibles and out-of-pocket maximums sooner, increases pressure on us, consumers, and the physicians involved to maximize whatever the dollar value is within that window before they, before they reach that. So I guess from the payer world, we say bring on the innovation. We want all of the different uh, options we can possibly have in our tool belt, and then we'll sort out the economics downstream and figure out what incentives need to be so we can get the right, the right therapies to our members and patients. Thank Thanks. you very much. So. We're now going to hear from Amy Comstock-Rick, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Parkinson's Action Network, and I should tell you, a crypto lawyer. I happen to know she has a JD. So, <laughs> But um, in some ways, this is actually sort of Amy's position on the program is, is typical uh, of, of the healthcare system, which is that patients are often the last people to be heard in the process, but uh, that should surely change over the next few years. Yeah, I wasn't going to comment on that, right. actually. <laughs> it was, it was I, I put you there to make the point, Amy. Okay, the so, clean anyway, up. <laughs> thank you very much for speaking. Uh, thank you, Stephen, um, and for having me. Um, I think I am here um, to assess, in this particular case, David's proposal from the perspective of an area of significant unmet medical need in this country. Um, so uh, along those lines, if you'll, uh, if you'll allow me, I'll just talk about Parkinson's disease for a minute so you have a context for my comments. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Parkinson's disease affects about a million people in this country. We really don't know for sure, but we think it's about a million people. Um, it's the traditionally viewed as a disease where the loss of the dopamine producing neurons in the brain, they die actually, and dopamine is, is significant for movement. Any of you have ever met anyone with Parkinson's disease would know that it's a progressive disease, and by the end, it's a pretty nasty disease, and by the end stage, you really can't move. Um, and many people, quite frankly, um, if you go to full end stage of the disease, will die of asphyxiation because you can't swallow anymore. So this is this is a very serious disease. We have no, no treatments that stop or slow the progression of the disease. We only have treatments that um, do work fairly well on the motor symptoms for about five to eight years, but then after that, those treatments don't work particularly well, and there's significant side effects to them. We also have no treatments at, the, at this time that treat the non-motor aspects of the disease, which include cognitive impacts, depression, sleep disruption, uh, many other serious symptoms. From an economic side to Parkinson's, a study that just came out in February of this year, Parkinson's adds an additional cost burden of $14.4 billion a year. Um, so it is, I 
from my view, and I assume you would agree, it does count as it, under the category of significant unmet medical need in this country. Um, responding, my, our task up here right now is to respond to David's proposal. And I would suggest that actually the uh, standard a, a period of exclusivity, uh, whether it's for biosimilars or pharmaceuticals, that is the same for, to spur innovation in all areas of innovation is not effective because there is such a drastic difference in the incentives for the various areas to be innovative that I would suggest that, as Aaron suggested as well, that um, the incentives should be tied to the areas of societal interest in, pr in improving health, um, and that that is exactly what we need. Looking at, um, you already saw these in David's proposal. These are the four areas where David suggested um, that you might have something what he referred to as a marginal drug if you either have lower probability of success, lower period for clinic, longer period, sorry, for clinical testing, lower expected value to patients or and fewer patients. And that um, if, if any of these apply and you have a, a shorter exclusivity period, then you may in fact lose the drugs that have any or all of these. But there is a suggestion in that we had a little bit of a cheat sheet. We had the written proposal before we came up here, the suggestion that these, um, that drugs, that these marginal drugs that we lose may be of little value uh, overall to the society. And I would suggest that, that that is in fact not the case. And I would use the central nervous system as um, the justification for that. As you can see from this chart, which I apologize is a little hard to read, but, um, but the clinical development period approval time, clinical approval success rate, and clinical development cost all for CNS drugs are significantly longer, smaller, or more expensive than in any other area. And so that would suggest to me that any standard period of exclusivity does not have the same impact depending on what area you look at, but it's actually a significantly more difficult to get a CNS drug through. Again, the, the time period, the clinical development period, eight, that adds to 8.8 .8 years. It's only you know, 0.1 longer than the, the next. But the clinical approval success rate, 8.2% is dramatic. The risk of failure is dramatic. And then again, the clinical development cost is, is significantly higher for CNS drugs. And then I would suggest to you even that, um, and of course you, many of you would not know this, that even with the CNS, Parkinson's can, can even be exacerbated even more because of some aspects of the disease that I'll talk about now. So you saw those numbers, lower probability of success. Um, only 8.2% of central nervous system drugs are approved, as we just saw in the prior chart. Why is that? We don't have good animal models. We simply don't have good animal models for Parkinson's disease and many other neurological diseases as well. But animals don't get Parkinson's disease. We give them drugs to kind of make it look like they have Parkinson's disease. But all we're doing is getting really good at making those animals able to move better. And we're not really getting very good at, at having, creating models of Parkinson's disease. Stem cells induced pluripotent stem cells are getting, are, is, there's real promise there in allowing us to have disease in a dish for Parkinson's disease, but we're a long way from that. Also, we have no good, we have no biomarkers for Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's disease, by some measures, is considered a slowly progressing disease. If you actually had the disease, I, th I doubt any of us would feel that it's progressing slowly, but the reality is compared to some others, it is slowly progressing. So that a clinical trial, really to measure whether, whether a potential treatment is doing any good, three years, probably three years, that's a really long and then translate expensive trial. But if we had a biomarker, some kind of quantitative assessment in, in your body, whether it's in, from blood, urine, or CF, CSF, some other way to, to quantify whether a potential therapy is doing any good, maybe we could assess that within six months and cut down all that trial time. 
And lastly, um, the brain is just really complicated. In many parts of our life, that's a good thing. But when you have a brain disease, it makes it very hard to understand. And, and actually, I should have added this too. With Parkinson's disease, there are many, many subtypes with the disease. There's actually some working theories now that Parkinson's isn't one disease, but it's maybe 20 diseases that end stage look very similar in terms of the motor symptoms. But we have many subtypes where, where what works for one may not work for another, and we simply don't understand that very well. So already, Parkinson's um, would have a lower probability of success. Longer period for clinical testing, as I showed in the earlier chart. Um, it's CNS drugs are the longest for clinical testing, um, and, and the preclinical work can be longer as well, for the same reasons, no biomarker and uh, slowly progressing. Also, uh, fewer patients. Um, we, the, the population, as I said, for Parkinson's disease is about a million. That's what we're guessing. Clearly not an orphan disease, but a million is not enough as we know, to be an incentive to create a drug. Alzheimer's, there's much more in the pipeline for Alzheimer's than Parkinson's disease. Alzheimer's population is five times the population of Parkinson's disease. And then if you get to some other diseases that are still above 200,000, which is the cutoff for orphan, but are still sig they're significant populations, but they're not a large enough market to be an incentive. But the expected value to patients, I could not put enough check marks next to that to indicate the value if there actually was a new therapy that would slow or even, heaven forbid, stop Parkinson's disease, the value would be dramatic. So for just based on that, I would suggest that what we should be talking about is exclusivity periods that are tied to the areas, significant areas of unmet medical need in, that, in this country so that we can, as best we can, equalize the incentives so that the innovation goes to areas of unmet medical need where the science is leading you that there's promise and the profit, it will not simply be the profit and the costs of devel development that lead to where the investments go. That's it. I stuck well, to my time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Amy. It's, it's I think, a, a great thing to loop it back to the actual problems faced by a, a population of, of patients with a currently un incurable disease. So the, the final uh, point of the program is uh, Jerome Reichman of Duke Law School is going to uh, briefly uh, comment on this uh, panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. There is a... Uh, how do I find it? Okay, thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, it's been a wonderful uh, conference, um, and I'm very enthusiastic about everything except David Ridley's proposal, so I have, <laughs> I have to be forgiven in advance. Had I more than five minutes, I would speak very enthusiastically about Professor Roin's uh, proposal for a clinical uh, uh, trial of uh, public uh, uh, spending uh, uh, funding of clinical trial data. There we have two articles on it. We've tried to move the ball uh, on this, but I have been asked to focus on the question of exclusive rights for uh, uh, clinical trial data as such. Uh, I personally think this and have written extensively on this. I think it's th uh, theoretically just wrong economics and empirically it's a disaster for developing countries. Let me see if I can explain why briefly. Theoretically, you may have a market failure with regard to the cost recovery of uh, clinical trial data, but it is not the market failure of an exclusive property right that protects non-obvious uh, innovation. That's what the patents do. Uh, this is a market failure of trade secret law. You cannot keep the know-how, the data, the test data results secret. Uh, you, have to, uh, you have to disclose them. But trade secret law never gives an exclusive property right. It gives a lead time privilege for cost recovery uh, uh, that lasts only until honest reverse engineering uh, occurs. Trade secret law is not based on exclusive property rights. It's a, a, what we call a liability rule, meaning a take and pay rule, a conduct based take and re a play, a, a pay rule. Trading a legal monopoly 
for a liability rule makes no economic sense at all. You need a better liability rule. And we always knew it. If you look at the something called the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, FIFRA, of the 1980s, we established a non-exclusive license for clinical trial data, safety data, uh, uh, which gives a, a non-exclusive license to all users which pay, who pay a reasonable royalty to the originators. This cost recovery model works very well. There is case law on it. In case they can't agree, there's a, a mandatory arbitration. It's been described in various articles. And it was what the United States initially proposed during the, uh, the first phases of the Uruguay round uh, uh, for what would be the treatment of test data under the, the TRIPS agreement, the agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property, in, uh, uh, which uh, ended up being in Article 39 of the TRIPS agreement, 39.3. However, at Geneva, during those negotiations, both the developed countries and the developing countries played hardball. And so the TRIPS agreement, Article 39.3, gave no serious protection to clinical trial data at all. It only protects against certain forms of uh, unfair competition. That hasn't stopped pharma from going around the world to various developing countries and saying, oh, yes, we got clinical trial data protection. And so I've had to testify again and again. The latest was Argentina, uh, 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 so that they, uh, against that interpretation of the TRIPS agreement. Meanwhile, pharma, as you know, persuaded Congress and uh, the European Commission to give them all these exclusive rights in clinical data. Let us pass over the methods by which pharma persuades legislators to do these things. Uh, but besides the economic contradictions, it's a killer for developing countries. Why? Because as soon as they get these rights, the European Commission and the United States Trade Representative put them into all our pending or existing uh, um, free trade agreements. Now the, it'll be the TPP and, and any other, the European partnership agreements with the developing countries. What will happen? As soon as they get that in there, <laughs> Uh, pharma will go to every country in which they don't have, a, a, the pharmaceutical uh, are not patentable under the TRIPS agreement, they weren't around at the time, or they're off patent, and they will say, well, now you have to bring all these drugs back. Uh, we have to have our eight or ten years of uh, uh, exclusive rights. And then what will they do? Uh, they will sell these drugs to the, uh, 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 under the, uh, they will drive the generics off the market, and they will sell them under the well-known 1090 uh, principle, mean, meaning at prices that the uh, wealthy 10% can afford, but not the poor 90%, because it pays more. So the end result is a disaster for global public health. Could the developing countries live with a liability rule? that is a reasonable royalty being paid to the originators for all uses under a non-exclusive license. Absolutely, they could. Developing country, uh, generic producers in developing countries aren't charities. They make plenty of money. Uh, it would be a win-win solution for everybody instead of a lose-lose because every generic uh, company would then have to pay a reasonable royalty. Uh, and, and I don't see any problems with that. And there would be cost recovery. <laughs> That would be a win-win solution for everybody. And with that thought, I leave you and thank you for the opportunity to speak. So we now have, uh, before the scheduled end of the conference, we have at least uh, 17 minutes for questions. So thanks, uh, David, and, and everybody for, for, for those thoughts. So I have um, some questions. I guess they're for David, but uh, some of them, uh, I think the rest of the panel uh, might have some things to say about as well. The first is um, just on the 10 years of data exclusivity. Uh, in my understanding, I think, David, you've done some work on this as well, is it's not going to matter that much. It's, it's going to matter for a relatively small number of drugs. Um, so you know, I, I think 80-something or 70-something percent of drugs are already sustaining more than 10 years based on their active ingredient patents, right? So um, related to something that Ben said earlier, it might be interesting to see what drugs would actually be affected by, by something like that. Second is if through the break-even analysis 10 years is the right number, then should that be the, uh, the uh, ceiling as well as the floor? Um, so right, so it's... Um, and then the third is, like, everything that I've read on like going back to Nordhaus and all that on uh, 
sort of optimal patent term suggests that non-uniformity is, is the optimal patent term, right? And I was thinking about your proposal in that context, and I guess I think, in fact, yours is a non-uniform proposal in a way. You're saying that, uh, in fact, things like things that have similar R&D costs and similar development times should have similar patent term. But if we were looking at other kinds of things, instead of the two categories you're looking at, you, know, you might have a shorter or longer uh, exclusivity term. Sorry. And so the question is, if we go down that road, do we want to do what a couple of people on the panel suggested, which is tailoring the extent of exclusivity to either the costs or the benefits of the, of the uh, innovation? And that's for anybody. Mm -hmm. Can I go for it? Please. Mm -hmm. So thanks, Bob. And you are one of the good guys since you are an economist. Uh, so, so I wrote down three questions. So first of all, uh, to what extent does exclusivity bind uh, when, when, you know, for most, for most drugs, the, the patent is, is what binds rather than the exclusivity. So what, what's the exclusivity binding for? And you alluded to it, and that's the drugs with weak, weak patents. And this does relate to Ben's point, perhaps, for the dormant drugs. So the drugs who, that are old, the patents have expired, they didn't make it to the market, but now you can test them for new uses and get to the market. So it helps in that regard. It doesn't help with some of the other things that Ben was talking about with the, the repurposing. So existing drugs maybe they even have generics that are on the market and getting a new indication. So it, it helps with part, uh, but not the other part. Uh, you also uh, said, you know, you know, what's the optimal length? If, if there's a floor, and I, I'm suggesting we move up the floor for the small and, and move it down a bit for the large, um, should there also be a ceiling? And I think that that would be uh, fair to consider. My fundamental point was it's arbitrary that there's eight years for small molecule and 12 years for large in the U.S. That's my fundamental point. If you take, Take away two things. One, the priority review, review voucher thing, talk to me afterward. But two, the 8 versus 12 is just arbitrary. And I don't think there are significant differences between small and large to justify that. So that's my fundamental point. Now, um, I, that doesn't mean I'm against any differences. If, if there are valid differences with regard to need, if we want to invest FDA or somebody else with the power to determine need and extend it, that's fine with me. Likewise, I'm not opposed to having rich versus poor country differences. Uh, to Jerry's point, I actually like Jenny Lanyell's proposal that you actually patent in rich countries or poor countries, but not both. So I'm not opposed to those differences. My fundamental point is just that the eight years for small versus the 12 years for large is arbitrary. And I guess the fourth thing I would note is that I like your proposal that we sit down and, and figure out which drugs these are and, and, try, and, and try to value these. I think that's a worthwhile research agenda. So, uh, Josh Sarna from Sorry, DePaul. Sorry, was someone else going to speak from the panel? Hmm? No. Okay. Um, so I have a comment, two modest proposals leading to a question. Um, the comment is that so much of this is assuming the anti-tax, anti-government approach to drug development, which is what's driving the need for market exclusivity or patents as the means of recouping the high level of costs. Um, so two modest proposals. One is rather than trying to recoup clinical costs, you could shift clinical costs back to the taxpayers in various ways, um, which raises important questions about comparative advantage. Um, even more modest proposal is you could just eliminate clinicals altogether and shift the cost to the liability system. Um, not necessarily preferred, but it's at least a way of thinking about how you fund the m much more limited costs of drug development um, without having to do the same kind of recoupment. Leads to the question, what do you actually think are the comparative advantages of the chemical development um, actors in the various systems that would suggest that either patents or market exclusivity are really the way to go? For anybody. So uh, I might just take one. It, that picks up on a, on a point that was made by Phil Johnson and by another one of the speakers, which is that the patent system slants the choice of drug candidates. So, um, in, in, as well, we talked about the inefficiencies of litigation, um, but there's a fundamental inefficiency uh, in terms of which candidates are moved forward under the current system, even when they are new chemical entities. Because uh, for the non-lawyers, when you have a, um, uh, when you have a, uh, 
a new chemical entity, if it's very similar looking to a, a previous chemical entity, say it's this thing and it just has a little methyl, just this, you know, if you remember your high school chemistry, the smallest possible change to a, to a, a carbon-based molecule, that, you know, maybe that's going to be found obvious. It was just an obvious thing to change in, in the design. That's grossly simplistic. So a, a candidate like that, even if it works the best, in the in the preclinical test may not be pursued for patent reasons. So there are there are reasons why data exclusivities can provide uh, incentives that just don't exist under the patent system. Well, uh, I'll say different stuff. I just <laughs> wanted to, to, to point out that uh, Bobbin's uh, demonstration uh, uh, this morning was. Uh, shocking evidence that we are, uh, with regard to the patent system that we're using in pharmaceuticals, we actually have the world's worst registration system. The, the French were the great champions of a registration system, and the French registration system was based on a high standard of non-obviousness and the fact that you couldn't bribe the, uh, you can't bribe yourself, or you could bribe the patent examiners, and your conscience would tell you not to invest if you couldn't meet the, the non-obvious standard. But of course, if you have a registration system with a, a low, uh, unworkable uh, standard, then you get prolif uh, ultimate infinite proliferation of bad patents, and, and that's what you demonstrate this morning. Why would, you want to, why would you want to address the problem? I'm not minimizing the problems that need to be addressed by putting even more exclusive property rights out there uh, in the way of the possibility of competition uh, uh, solving the problem. Uh, you're, you're restoring competition at the same time with the liability rule, you're restoring, the, you're, you're recovering the cost, and to the extent that the cost, there, there is a possible gap, and I absolutely, I, I'm, I'm very skeptical about the gap under a properly functioning liability rule, uh, then there is a very strong case for the government funding of clinical trials in areas with high public uh, health payoff, as, as we have suggested in a couple of articles. And, uh, and I am sensitive to the, the, the many people say these could be high areas of public health payoff. So why not address the problem directly with government funding of the clinical trials with a liability rule in there and let as many firms get into the action uh, as 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 the want to, knowing that they're going to have to share their results with the originator company, a, a, a portion of their profits with the originator companies. I stopped it. I, I should chime in here, actually. Uh, so there's, I, would, I would add two things to this. So one is there's actually a bunch of distinct things going on here that don't necessarily interact with your policy suggestion. So um, we could imagine a world where the government's funding a lot of R&D. We can imagine a prize system. A lot of the things we're talking about here are still very relevant. You would do the same thing. You would just do it under a prize system, or you would do it under government-funded R&D. So if it doesn't make sense to sort of differentiate in terms of there are rewards, the biologics versus small molecules, or if we want to be sort of in some sense paying attention to the indication and have rewards for developing new indications for older drugs and like that, we'd want to do that with a prize system. We'd want to do that with government funding for R&D. These are all things. And we, you know, by the way, if, if the NIH is funding all drug development, suppose we just eliminate the pharmaceutical industry, we would still probably want to be able to count uh, indications and so know which drugs are being prescribed for because that would give us a lot of really valuable information. So these basic proposals, they're sort of, it, it, in some sense, however we're financing the system, a lot of the stuff, the insights we're talking about here are just as relevant. Um, the second thing is that I think that the, the financing system we're currently using is more nuanced than what we give it credit for being. So we often talk about the patent system and market exclusivity as if it's, well, we're granting exclusivity and the consumers pay a whole bunch and it's kind of, met, and, and there's deadweight loss and it's bad. Uh, in reality, so first, someone has to pay for it. There's just a rule. Like, it costs money, so someone has to pay. Now, one thing we could do is we suggest just get rid of the, the cost part, and so you have a liability system. I won't, that, that's, it's really, I suppose I want to address that. Um, but what we currently do in the U.S., uh, and this is a little bit, well, actually, let's start with Europe. So what Europe does, Europe has, has a lot of other, most developed countries, they've got uh, exclusivity, either patent-based or market exclusivity. Then they have insurance that's financed primarily through the tax system that pays for drugs. So people get access through that way. Um, which actually looks a lot like a lot of the prize proposals you see, where the government would tax consumers and then sort of pay prizes for sales, stuff like that. So it's very similar. Um, and in the U.S., we do it a little bit differently. 
Right. Yeah. So price regulated. Right. Yeah. So in the U.S. So in the yeah. So they have to and they have to control it on both ends. In the U.S. We do it a little bit differently. We have private insurance, but we subsidize private insurance at the lower income levels. We create we sort of force people into these insurance pools. So we actually kind of replicate the system. Consumers are paying for it, but we do all these sorts of things. And so it's in, there's all these different models we can imagine, and there's different ways we can play around. But I think we need to think about it not in terms of it's all one gigantic decision and all right, but these are lots of different things, and we need to be paying attention to each of them individually and figuring out how to optimize it and not link our analysis of what's the proper standards for what should be, what, where there should be incentives or shouldn't be incentives to how we're financing it because we can kind of do it under both systems. Hi, uh, Kevin Collins, Washington University. Uh, I have a quick question about something that's a little tangential but I think very on point for this conference which is therapeutics. Uh, so this panel so far has talked about biomarkers and um, personalized medicine uh, as means of both improving uh, welfare of patients and making healthcare more cost effective at the same time. But a previous panel had mentioned the fact that actually the patent regime right now is reducing its uh, amount of incentives for therapeutics uh, because of a number of Supreme Court cases recently that have taken away a certain kind of patent protection. Uh, so I'm wondering if this creates a question where we should be asking about alternative incentives for developing therapeutics. I'm wondering if the um, panel has any thoughts about uh, either whether there's a need for that, whether actually the uh, amount of uh, exclusivity or uh, patent protection for uh, new molecule compounds for therapeutics uh, would end up providing sufficient patent protection uh, for incentives for the development of new diagnostics. I think I was saying therapeutics before. I when mean I meant diagnostics, diagnostics I apologize. Right, yeah. that, that word was, was getting switched in around in my mind. My, my apologies. So I'm really interested in diagnostics. Uh, and that's, we'd, we'd mentioned, uh, uh, this panel hinted that they'd becoming much more valuable, yet we've also noticed patent um, uh, protection for them decreasing, so there's a question whether we need alternative incentives for diagnostics, my apology. Uh, uh, is there enough uh, uh, thoughts on that? Or the the follow-on question is it might be very difficult to do because currently the FDA actually doesn't have regulatory authority over diagnostics, so we can't have the same kind of market exclusivity regime for diagnostics that we have for therapeutics. Thoughts on diagnostics? So, um, the proposal I had about sort of a way of doing new uses for existing drugs, that would actually work for diagnostics, at least if the diagnostics are linked to a drug. Uh, so what, what ha the Supreme Court has sort of gone after, I don't even, I'm not sure if they knew they were doing it, but they've gone after diagnostic patents with a hatchet. And uh, there was a whole bunch of problems in that market before, and so it's not clear how much harm that did, but there's certainly a problem here. Um, you can protect drugs, and if you could protect drugs as prescribed for a particular indication, and that indication is linked to a diagnostic, and that's easily observable, that would actually, that's just a, it's coming at it from the drug side, and so you still don't have any protection over the diagnostics, but that would work. Uh, and so this would be a way of taking a space that's currently very difficult to patent and making it protectable again. So the, the pending Modern Cures Act, that's modern with a double D, um, does have a proposal for finding, uh, for providing incentives for uh, diagnostics. Do you want? No. Um, but it also is the reverse because people also look at diagnostics as a way of providing income to someone who comes up with a new use for a, uh, a generic drug repurposing. So people are also looking the opposite. In fact, diagnostics is kind of a bit of a mess at the moment in the sense that the Supreme Court cases come at just at the time as we move into personalized medicine when diagnostics are more important than ever and the whole concept of a drug coupled with a companion diagnostic is, is starting to revolutionize you know, effective delivery of medicine by meaning you only give the right drugs to the people who actually uh, benefit from them. Steve, could I just add Please. very quickly to that, too? Um, in the area of diagnostics, one of the incentives, of course, is, is reimbursement. That's how you make your profit uh, for a therapeutic or a diagnostic. But at least from the CMS perspective, um, our understanding is that it, it's much more difficult when you do a reimbursement analysis when you're creating a, a research creating a diagnostic that the guarantee of being reimbursed, and that Blue Cross may want to speak to this, uh, the likelihood of being re reimbursed, at least under Medicare, is it will take much, much longer to get your code so that the incentive is not there to create the diagnostic. But that said, obviously, for, for diseases like Parkinson's, many others, if you had the diagnostic, could, could determine whether someone would respond to the therapy. It would be remarkably helpful. 
I'll throw just uh, two cents in there. Uh, one of the first things that they teach you in medical school is not to do a test that the answer to which cha doesn't change the, the, um, the treatment of the patient. And so I think part of the, the, the enticement of having companion diagnostics where the drug and the test go together is you know that they're built with the same mechanism in mind and you know that they're, they're linked so that you can get some clinical information to the treating clinician on the back side of it. Part of our problem is, is not that we don't want to cover lots and lots of diagnostics, but we have hundreds, literally hundreds of genetic tests right now that are completely worthless to the doctor that orders it because it, it adds to the cost of care, it confuses the heck out of the patient, and there's no, there's no specific information or change in the management of the patient. So, so I would agree with you that um, clearly reimbursement is one of the fundamental things that researchers need to be aware of when they're even looking into the research to develop a new diagnostic, but the more and more that it can be linked with therapies, the more we can get around some of the legal mess we have around diagnostics as a standalone entity, and the more we can actually put more useful tools in the hands of the clinicians that would use it on the back side. I actually agree with everything you said, and I purposely, it wasn't just, uh, not just because you're sitting here, I think CMS <laughs> is really needs to be pushed more than the private payers. Definitely, and, and yeah. as, as powerful as people think insurance companies are, we um, look very closely at everything that CMS does and usually are in tow with the decision making. Hi, um, I had a question actually relating back to what you said earlier. Um, we, act, we have a uh, concrete example of a situation of a product that is off patent, uh, found to be very useful through publicly funded clinical trials in a high risk population um, where a pharmaceutical company is not interested in filing for a new indication despite the data exclusivity. And the reason for that is the costs are so low that it's not worth it for them to pay the fees associated with filing a supplement um, or you know, to essentially pursue it. Um, it's also a product that a generic manufacturer also can't take on because of the restricted uh, regulatory pathway to pursue it. So in that type of a situation where you have something that would clearly benefit public health, reduce healthcare costs, um, we don't have a very good um, solution through data exclusivity. What alternative incentives do you think can be proposed in, in that scenario? So I'm a little bit iffy on the, the fact pattern. It's, the, um, it's a generic drug, but there aren't generics on the market. There are generics on the market? There are generics on the market, okay. but it's useful for a new indication. Right. And it's because it's been off the yeah. You know, I think our option set is, one, the a standard is to grant a patent on it again, essentially, and kick the generics off the market. We're not willing to do that. I actually think for good reason, um, but, you know, some people push the other way. Um, two is have government funding for it, which we, is what we currently do, but there's just very limited government funding currently. And so the third is to come up with a way to enforce data exclusivity or, or patent exclusivity, but only over the new indication. And if you could enforce it only over the new indication, then you actually could do it. Uh, and so that's kind of what I was pushing. But so even if the, the challenge I think we face, so even if you enforce data exclusivity, you have innovative companies that say that's not sufficient for us to be entrants in the market. Right, but be, well, and, and I, I happen to think that at the back end, if you do do that and enforce yeah. the data exclusivity, you'll end up the government will end up paying more on the back end than they if they would have invested the money up front in the first end. I think it's sort of a little bit defeatist to say there is no government money out there. There's so much wasted government spending on pharmaceuticals and other products that are not useful, or that, that where there's some drugs that are that are known to be better than others, yet the, that drug is being, still being prescribed. There's so much waste in the system that could be directed towards trying to correct problems like this at the front end. And the pro I think the problem is in the past what the government has done is try to expand, you know, promote market. It has done exactly that. In the case of Colchicine, for example, they enforced market exclusivity, kicked all the generic drugs off the market, and now they're paying loads of money for the same drug they could have paid before. And if they just would have paid a little bit of that money up front, they could have saved a lot more money down the road. But it's a very short-sighted way of looking at things. 
Okay. So I'm going to take the co-organizer's prerogative and respond really quickly to your question. You said that there's data out there saying that this is good for this use. Why not just publish the data and have everyone prescribe it off-label? Because it's in a high-risk population, so physicians are afraid to prescribe it. It's not a disease population. It raises medical malpractice issues. And so you know, there are situations where you fall sort of into that category. I personally think that the fix in these types but of But there's good data supporting the use. But, there, there so then that would be it's, I mean, from a practice issue. Yeah. You mean, you mean waiving regulatory filing fees, not waiving regulatory right. filing. Okay, yeah. great. I was gonna, just wanted to be clear. Or setting up All right, yeah. so. Yeah, so that's actually something I was going to say was yeah. that throughout repurposing, people occasionally come across liability issues and they suggest some kind of government insurance backed by government reinsurance uh -huh. for resolving liability issues. Yeah. All right, so. We have um, kept you for a very long time, but you've been a great audience and, um, and a great panel. Um, so let's thank our panel.